thank? I'd like to thank the uh, Binghamton colleagues who I've been working with as well, uh, Associate Dean Andreas Pape and Nicole Smith and Ingo uh, Yangabi Ingo, as well as um, Gretchen Mahler, the uh, interim dean of the graduate school. I want to thank you all for being here today, and I'm so excited for today's guest to have a conversation with me. So I'm not going to say much more. Um, I'll say a little bit of her bio, but one of the key things I want everybody to know is that today's guest was recommended directly to us by um, the wonderful, magnificent poet, author, playwright, NYU uh, creative writing professor, Claudia Rankin. And so this is a very special guest that we have with us today. Um, Romarilyn Ralston earned a bachelor's degree in gender and feminist studies from Pitzer College and a master's in liberal arts from Washington University in St. Louis after 23 years of incarceration. And Romerilyn is especially focused on building power, sharing space, and empowering systems impacted BIPOC women and other justice-involved people from all backgrounds through the transformative power of post-secondary education and community building. She's a longtime member and organizer of the California Coalition for Women Prisoners and serves on the leadership committee. From Maryland sits on several national boards, including the Alliance for Higher Education in Prison, the Education Trust, and Freedom Reads, also known as the Yale Million Book Project. In 2022, Ralston received a full pardon from Governor Gavin Newsom, and I am so delighted to welcome you to joining us today, Mer Maryland. And Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Brown. Of course. Oh, and you can feel free to call me David, whatever you prefer. <laughs> uh, so Thanks, I want to jump right in. Yeah, thank you. I want to jump right in because we have so much to, to cover. Um, but I just want to start with where you are now and then work our way backwards to how you got here, because you have such an amazingly inspiring never give up story that people really could benefit from hearing. So what is Project Rebound? And can you tell me about your role there and how long you've been there? Sure. I'm the executive director for Project Rebound at Cal State University Fullerton. We launched the program in 2016. So I've been at the university almost seven years. But a little bit about Project Rebound, it was started in 1967 by Dr. John Irwin, who served five years in prison for armed robbery. While he was in prison, he started taking college courses. When he paroled, he had earned about 24 units and he wanted to continue his education. So he applied to UCLA and was accepted to the oh. sociology, to, yes. <laughs> and then graduated with uh, his undergrad degree and went on to UC Berkeley where, where he earned a PhD and started teaching in San Francisco State um, and became one of the most renowned carceral studies uh, professors, I think, in the world. He passed away in 2010, but he left a legacy at San Francisco State um, in Project Rebound, where it had been working uh, with incarcerated, formerly incarcerated people to help them matriculate into the CSU system, which is the largest public university system in the country. And in 16, it expanded to eight additional campuses, Fullerton being one of them, where I joined Cal State Fullerton and Help to launch a program there. Today, we have 15 campus programs across the CSU, which contains 23 campuses. And so we're the largest state um, university system that has programs specifically designed to support formerly incarcerated and just as in, uh, impacted people. That is fantastic. I didn't know all of those details. Um, and, you know, when I think about what you just said, when you're talking about John Irwin, legacy is so important. I mean, because clearly his legacy impacted you in some ways. It uh, did. And it's really weird because the 23 years I was inside of a California prison, I had never heard of Project Rebound. Okay. Oh, it wow. Wasn't until, <laughs> I know. It wasn't until I had been released in 2011 and went on to Pitts College in Wash U that I found out about Project Rebound through the job announcement. And then I started to look at it and I thought, wow, I see why this program needed to be expanded because it was solely housed 
in the Bay Area at San Francisco State. And so it didn't have the right resources or traction it needed to really support this huge population. You know, 50,000 people are on parole in California alone. Over 70 million folks in this country have some type of criminal history. So this is a huge demographic of folks that are sometimes not even recognized as having access to post-secondary education. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's, people get left behind in all kinds of ways. And even from and because my sister is actually an elementary school teacher. And she talks to me all the time about the prison, um, the school to prison pipeline. Uh, yes. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. <laughs> so another thing that you share with me is the Center for Hope and Redemption. Um, what is that and why are entities like it so important? Yeah, the Center for Hope and Redemption is a space we just launched um, March 15th, and it was created. Thank you. Thank you. It was created um, for not only our program to have a, a student space, but also to do some really, uh, I think, important work um, in dismantling the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to create a uh, transformative justice center where we could partner with other community-based organizations that are doing social justice work with other justice centers like at Columbia and UCLA and other places, but to also partner with research centers um, who are doing this kind of work in producing reports and um, work around uh, mass incarceration and prisons like the Sentencing Project the RAND Corporation, um, all of these kinds of um, big think tanks that are producing amazing reports. We wanted to be able to have a space where folks could find one, of, like I said, one of the largest groups of formerly incarcerated scholars, which, in, which is within the CSU system, and use us to make sure that we are informing the work, the critical work that really needs to be done with dismantling the prison system. Hmm. And so think tanks, because I had a sort of second part of this question. Uh, so how might an entity like Center for Hope and Redemption um, make sense for working professionals who are seeking to be change agents? So like someone who's getting, you know, a master's or a PhD, could a think tank actually use someone like them professionally? Yeah, I think so. One of the things we wrote into our proposal was to have visiting scholars come and work with our students to develop research projects, white papers, um, leadership development, because we also have a juvenile justice program called Dare to Dream, where we go inside of Orange County juvenile facilities and actually provide them with um, a college foundation, the basics, you know, how to enroll, some soft skills, leadership skills, things like that. So in bringing PhD students in as visiting scholars, not only would they be able to work with some of our students at Cal State Fullerton, but they would also be able to work with incarcerated youth okay. who are I, also taking college courses. I really hope people are listening to that because I love, actually I do um, some like Shakespeare work with students, middle school, high school students, and it's it's really enlightening for me. I learned so much from working with them. So that's a really great opportunity for folks. Um, yeah, I'd love to have some folks send me an email. <laughs> so there you heard it first here, send from Maryland an email. Um, and what is your email address then? It's rralston at fullerton.edu. There you go, folks, write it down. <laughs> um, when we had our pre-session chat, you also mentioned that you were in the Navy. And, um, you know, I've worked at the University of Arizona and there was a pretty significant like Navy military population there um, of students. And so what kind of skills did you develop when you were in the Navy that serve you today? And I'm asking that question because I think it's important for people to process actively how the work and tasks that we do in different jobs can still be useful to us, even when we're no longer in those spaces or positions. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the, I think two skills really stand out for me that I developed. One is accountability, hmm. you know, to a team, you know, to go to work every day, know that you're on a team uh, and you have a common mission. 
And so the work I do now really reminds me of that because we all share lived experience with incarceration, just like in the military, you share that experience. And so working with folks who come from a similar background that you can be accountable to, and that also, you know, the same struggles that they're going through. You know, these are a huge, uh, the prison industrial complex and the military industrial complex are very similar. Okay. I would like to know more about that. How, what makes you say that? Well, you know, they're, they're both um, government run entities. You know, they're, they're very powerful. The budgets are very large. You know, people come into these systems um, from, uh, from all walks of life. But what, what I, I think really makes them kind of similar is that many people that walk away from corrections and walk away from the military, you know, have, have lots of issues, mm. you know, like our veterans, you know, PTSD. Um, it's, a, it's the same thing that happens within carceral spaces, mm. you know, whether you are um, an incarcerated person or you work in corrections, PTSD is super high because of the type of environment that um, the controlled environment that both of these spaces create. Mm, and I can imagine the trauma that generates in those. Ooh, ooh. Too. That's a whole nother show, Dr. Brown. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we have to do part two. <laughs> um, and so speaking of, you know, prison industrial complex, um, as I, you know, shared in your bio just a little bit, but I'll say more here at age 24. So in 1988, you went to prison and you were released in 2011 and fully pardoned by Gavin Newsom in Governor Gavin Newsom in 2022. And that part of your your life story when we were talking was one I appreciated it because of just how resilient you are, but also because um of your willingness to tell the story. And you, you know, sometimes you'll see people, they will be willing to share a story but the it's you can see that there's still shame there's and things that society has made them drag along with them and i didn't get that from you and i was like wow you are so inspiring so can you take us back to age 24 so our audience can understand like how did you get to the highly successful leadership position you're in today and like what was the life change like for you at 24 because that's a big change yeah so when i when i went to prison i was sentenced to life and I'd never been involved in the juvenile system before. I'd never been to jail. You know, I had just recently been released from the military about a year and a half. And, you know, my life had gotten really chaotic when I was separated from the military. I started using drugs. I was hanging out with the wrong crowd. And, you know, it was, it was, I was homeless. I had two kids. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And I had all of this PTSD, you mm. know, all of these um, issues with domestic violence and childhood trauma. And, you know, like I said, all the other stuff that I was experiencing, lack of employment and housing. And how do I take care of these two kids and going from couch to couch and house to house? It was at 24 years old. That's a lot. I, I, it was a lot. And I, I actually was suicidal at that time. And I had thought about taking my own life several times. And, you know, the, the more I use drugs to try to medicate those mm -hmm. feelings, the, the angrier I became. Mm. I have so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, and I think a lot of people experience that. And so when I got to prison, I, I knew I had to do something with my life, but I was sentenced to to never leave prison. Mm -hmm. And it was the women inside of that prison that told me about education, told me about the colleges that were coming in and providing uh, support. Mm -hmm. And they said, you should enroll because I always wanted to be a college student. You know, right out of high school, you know, I started having kids, got married and whatnot. And I, I enrolled in college and I just fell in love with learning. I fell in love with having debates in the classroom with some of my peers and arguing with professors who were coming in from the different community colleges about 
you know, deviance and crime and all of these kinds of things, because sometimes you academics. <laughs> preach, <laughs> preach, preach, go on. <laughs> you know, you only know what you know from a book, yep. you know, and, and it's so biased and one-sided. So to actually challenge some of that and to think critically about the different pathways that lead to incarceration and what rehabilitation really is. And, you know, just to look at, you know, individual struggles that people have, mm -hmm. you know, and women. So I just fell in love with all of that. And then the 94 crime bill hit. And because of that, um, incarcerated students were exempt from being able to apply for Pell Grants. So we lost access to funding. Mm. Therefore, community colleges didn't have that money to support incarcerated students. So they left us, basically. Yeah, they pulled out of pro hundreds of programs across the country, leaving thousands of incarcerated students with, just like John Irwin, a handful of credits. And so and, and, that's uh, why I went back to school. Brain full of more trauma. That that had to yeah. be traumatic for people. It, it was. And so we were left with, you know, correspondence schools, um, distance education programs. And I, I must have enrolled in everything that came my way. Some of them good, some of them bad. But I wanted to keep learning. And I, I had really enjoyed that space. So I did. I continued to do that. It was costly and expensive, but I did it. Hmm. And so when I think about the fact that, you know, like you realize, even though you got to this space where you're in here for life, you have this thirst for knowledge and desire to go to college. So you really found a way to still meet a goal, even though it seemingly got derailed like big time. Um what other challenges and setbacks did you experience on your journey? You know, you mentioned the crime bill. Um, what did the crime bill mean for you? Like we mentioned the word trauma and just how devastating I imagine that was. What did it mean for you? It was just another level of punishment. It was another way to punish people for committing a crime. You know, there's so, that's why we call it the, you know, the prison industrial complex is it's just a web of things. It continues while you're inside by being barred from so many things that could help you um, rehabilitate, like education. Um, a lot of times our children are stuck in the foster care system and uh, not being taken care of. There's just all of these barriers to things when we get out. You know, there's 48,000 collateral consequences to having a felony record, according to the ACLU. So there's just so many layers and layers and layers of punishment that a person experiences and many times for a lifetime. Mm. And even someone like me that has a pardon, you know, um, I'm still I can I'm still subjected to the background check, which makes me very vulnerable okay. to an employers and other things that I want to do in my life. I can't even get TSA clearance. Oh, really? Even with the pardon. Wow. So this, so it, it follows, it doesn't go it away. It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. As long as you're still in the system, um, all of your business is out there for someone to find. Unless your record is expunged and sealed. Okay. And even if it's expunged, your your record can still be found. It'll just say that there's an expungement and it'll strike it. Hmm. So, I mean, when I hear that, <laughs> there were more setbacks than I knew about from our conversation. Um, they didn't stop with the crime bill, you know, and, and I think even in this term setbacks, as I sort of think about linking it to our conversation, um, rejection is another way to think about it because you were rejected for parole several times. Um, what kept you going in the face of those seemingly insurmountable challenges? You know, my grandmother, hmm. you know, I had a praying grandmother like a lot of us black folk do. And the few times that she came to see me, she just had such hope uh, in her eyes. 
She wanted me to be home. Uh, she wanted me to have the life that she always dreamt of me having. And she wanted me to, um, you know, be able to reconnect with my children that I had left behind. Mm. And so every time I would go to the parole board and they would deny me parole, I'd have to call her to say, Mom, I didn't get it. Oh. And she would always want to know why. And I and I tell her, they, they say the crime. They say the crime. They say the crime. I haven't done enough time. I haven't done enough time. I haven't done enough time. And so finally, in 2007, um, the Lawrence case went to the California Supreme Court, which What's established uh, Sandra Lawrence, okay. who was a friend of mine inside, uh, took her case to the Supreme Court through um, USC Post Conviction Justice Project. Okay, and, and they actually won uh, because she was in the same situation. She had gone to the parole board eleven times. Many times she had been found suitable but never released. Either the governor rescinded her date, which happened once in my case, right. um, and so she never went home. But the California Supreme Court ruled in the Lawrence case <laughs> in court, that um, there must be a nexus. Some connection between the crime and the today. Okay. And so that's how I eventually ended up being released because the courts had to step in and say, Well, Marilyn is fully rehabilitated. She has done everything that the parole board has asked her to do and then some. And actually, the word he used was eviscerate. Hmm. And so. But again, the governor who has ultimate power can then snatch that date back and say, no, 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 no. I don't want you to go home, which he has, which he did in my case. And that was Arnold Schwarzenegger at the time. And does I'm guessing here, because I know some about the prison, prison industrial complex, that comes back to money on some level, doesn't it? It comes back to money, but mostly power and public perception. You right. know, governors of political figures, they want to make sure that they have um, the ability to run and get reelected. And so many of them run on tough on crime bills. And we've seen this throughout history with Reagan and with Nixon, Reagan, Clinton, uh, and everyone else, except for, you know, even President Obama uh, has some issues there. But in this case, and in California, Huge tough on crime legislation was happening back in the in the nineties. You know, we were building prisons like we were building uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises. Mm. Um, we built twenty prisons. You know, from from nineteen I think seventy eight or nineteen eighty to about two thousand. So this is a huge prison state, and so the political climate around incarceration, especially those sentenced to life. Uh, is a huge issue. So the governor with ultimate power can can snatch that date back and rescind it from even the board of uh, prison hearings uh, who find, find, find you suitable. So more trauma. More trauma. So to go there in that hearing and be subjected to that, most people have seen Shawshank Redemption. Hmm. And so that scene and, and how they talk to you and then you get denied and denied and denied and it's the same process. That's that's one of the most realistic um, uh, accounts of what happens actually happens within those hearings that I've seen in film. Mm, okay. And so when you were talking, you mentioned the USC Post-Conviction Justice Project. And um, I'm curious... How could someone who's pursuing higher education, for instance, um, use their skill set to be involved with an organization like that or or do social justice work like you do? I think it's very important for PhD students to get involved with social justice or to get involved with legal clinics, just to use your skill set. Um, the way that you approach problems and problem solve is much different um, at that level because you've gone through all of these different levels of education. And so now you're really thinking critically and you're thinking through research. And so you have that now skill set to research 
what was what's been done before and to tease out the good pieces and the bad pieces. And so, and that's what we need in in this in doing this work. We need folks that can think critically, do their research so that they can actually present solutions. You know, we know that we have problems, but we need solutions. If we're not going to involve folks who've been directly impacted by issues, we need to involve people who have the skill set to be neutral and to find the solutions that are possible. And I think students, because of the nature of how they think and because they're, they're, they're still experiencing um, life and growing in different ways, are able to see beyond. You know, they they have a they have a vision somewhat. Um, and the students I've worked with um, over the years that I was incarcerated, the the way that they wrote my story. This is how I can tell my story today. You know, we would sit in the visiting room and they would just ask me questions about my life. And when it was time to go to the parole board, the package how they packaged me all of my certificates and achievements within the prison, but also my childhood, my trauma, my marriage, the military, the things that I had done and the things that I want to do and how they were able to use different frameworks, you know, the framework of abolition, the framework of, of, of all of these other disciplines to put together an argument that said, I am rehabilitated and I should be released. Uh, it was just incredible. And, and that's something that I really aspired to do inside. And that's why I continued my education. So that is also like fabulous, fabulous guidance because um, I think of myself in that way. I always say I'm in the business of solving problems. And I'm like, sometimes I'm walking around the world and I see a problem. I'm like, I need to turn that off. It's just impossible to do. But what you just said about solutions but even beyond that writing a story or using a framework like that's what people do when they write theses and dissertations um and books i just finished having to do one of those and so but that was the question that my one of my mentors i love him so much arthur little he would always ask me what story are you trying to tell with this book mm -hmm. i'm not seeing it right now and it's like I don't understand a book story, but it really does. You really do have to tell a story. And so they took your narrative and really crystallized it for, for people at a certain level. Exactly. And, and you have to have that skill set. You have, you need to have enough education to be able to pull in different disciplines, you know, to create a story that's really powerful and transformative. You can't do that unless you have you know, a master's degree or more, or you just come from a literary family where you have that social capital and you just, you're just a phenomenal writer, hmm. you know, but look at the work of Claudia Rankin, where we talk right. about, you know, right. to, to be able to pull in critical race theory and to pull in sociology and to pull right. in gender right. and to pull in yeah. all of these things. And then to do it in such a, a small package, yes. you know, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, and and that ability to again, I mean, she's like really great at that. Just taking ideas and boiling them, boiling them down. If you ever have a conversation with her, she's very sharp with her word choice, and it's so precise. Yeah, to synthesize, mm -hmm. you know, a lifetime of experiences into fifty pages. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, that is pretty awesome. And I think I'm going to back up just for a second because I don't know if people got the total gist of it, but I think this is another resource name that you've thrown out there. What is, um, can you just tell us a little bit about the Post-Conviction Justice Project? Sure. So USC, you know, law school, which is one of the, I think, top law schools in the country. They have a Post-Conviction Justice Project, a law clinic, where they're able to utilize law students in doing work um, for prisoners. Okay. And so Heidi Rummel and Michael Brennan are the, the law professors that run the law clinic. Okay. And over the years, they've represented hundreds of incarcerated people at parole board hearings 
And so that that work that they've done to help people get released has just been incredible. If you go to their website, you'll see a lot of our stories there. None of us have returned to prison. None of us. And, you know, their their work is is so important. And, and there's that's like the Innocence Project, which also does really important work. There's a lot of other law clinics across the country that are connected to colleges and universities that do this kind of work. But I think the work of USC Post-Conviction Justice Project, the more they do it, mm -hmm. the better they become. They keep winning and winning and winning. And it's not really their work. It's the combined effort of the story, the life that they are representing, and their skill set, you know, because these are students primarily sitting in those parole board hearings with us that we meet with over and over again to share our stories with. And the impact that our lives have on that law student yeah. to go then out in the world once they get their degree and practice their training in, a, I think, a, a more humanistic way. You know, they don't just, even if they go into corporate law, you know, they, they're reminded that there's people behind that. Yeah. And so it's really important, I think, um, when you are working with underrepresented communities and populations, you know, to, to learn that there are people in the world that are far worse off than you. Mm -hmm. And to experience that, you know, and to be able to bring that empathy into your work is such a skill that I think everyone needs to do because it's all about relationships. We're yeah. all on this blue marble together. Yes, we are. And it's important. And that empathy component, you know, not everybody has that because some people look at even just what you said um, about some people being worse off than you and they only use that to feel better about their position as opposed to thinking about how they could maybe reach out and also help bring other people up um, or be a model for people like you are and showing people that you don't have to stay where you get put, you know, you can work your way out of there. And so at 40, speaking of working your way out of places at 47, you know, you finally won release and you left prison with a lot of education under your belt. Um, and I'm curious about just what credentials did you have? And and also, again, because I think I'm just going to drive this point home for people. You faced additional setbacks. Um, your college credits didn't transfer. Um, you also noted that college was just very different on the outside of prison. And um, you also wanted to do some ministry work. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So inside, I, I started in a AA program and then the crime bill hit. And so I continued with distance education or correspondence schools. Um, I earned my AA degree and then I earned a bachelor's degree in human behavior from Newport University, which was a correspondence school. I went on to get a master's from a seminary school in Sacramento, California, and then um, a, a doctorate in uh, Christian philosophy from the Christian Leadership University in New York. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to get into, I wanted to get into ministry. I wanted to help people. I really enjoyed um, teaching Bible study inside and going to church. I attended every service there was. I, Catholic service, Protestant services, uh, the Native American community. I, I did powwows and sweat lodges. The Jewish community, I, I studied with the rabbi. And even the Muslim community, I studied with them. I was taking Arabic classes and, and fasting during Ramadan. And it was just so fascinating to me, the connections that we all share uh, across the five faiths that were represented inside. And I thought ministry was going to be a place for me. You know, as a kid, when I was going through a lot of trauma, um, it was nuns who took my family in. And so while I was inside, I had this period of time where I thought, okay, maybe I could do something, you know, be a lay person, you know, give my life to God and, you know, reconnect. And that's what I wanted to do. So we were ordained in the prison by a ministry team. 
We taught classes. We even created our own ministry group, the Women of Destiny. So there was four of us. We we had gospel. We had a gospel choir. I mean, everything. And so I thought ministry was going to be it for me. And then when I was released in 2011, I realized that my doctorate degree did not have the right credentials or or accreditation that mm-hmm. I could use on the outside. It's an international religious accreditation through a bunch of churches. Okay. And so it wasn't valid um, really in California under the WASP accreditation. And That's so I just, I didn't even, I didn't even try any, I just hit a roadblock and I said, okay, pivot because you're 47 years old. You need to keep this pushing lady. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, a friend of mine who's professor at Scripps college and also I was at a women's uh, home, a transitional home. She was the president of that transitional home. Uh, she served on the board as president. And she suggested that I apply to Pitzer College because I had some units that were transferable. And so I applied to Pitzer College and I was accepted early admissions. I graduated with honors. And then through that experience on a college campus, I was really introduced to social justice work. I got involved in going inside a youth facility and and teaching a on what poetry class. <laughs> I met Claudia uh, while I was at the Claremont Colleges, okay. and I created a, a an independent study a, a, and a reintegration academy for the women at the transitional program that I had come through, and I just started to get involved more and more and more. And when I went to St. Louis for grad school and a choral fellowship in 2014, Michael Brown was killed. Mm. And I just emit, I was living in North County, okay. right next to Ferguson. And I just I just felt a call to do something. So I got up and I went down to ground zero, you know, every morning that I didn't have classes. And I was just among the people marching with my hands up and just being involved. And that that helped to set me on this course to oh, where I am today. And this is a side note question, because now I'm just thinking of all the things that would have gone through my mind to make that decision. If I were you, were you scared to put yourself in that position just because of where you, you know, everything that's scared to death? I was on parole. Right. I was on parole and I'm out there and Ferguson police are everywhere and. Yes, it was very scary, mm. but I would not have been able to live with myself if I had not done what I needed to do. And that is and so, that was to be involved with my community, my people. And, you know, a through line, this is, I mean, you didn't use this word, but to me, a word that comes to mind when you say what you just said is intuition. Like you followed what your intuition was was guiding you towards and look at look at just how the progression has been for you. That's so awesome. Um, Speaking of just one more thing about, you know, thinking about pivoting, um, what kind of support systems did you have as you've dealt with all the rejection that you faced? Because it, it, it's a lot, just even what you're describing. I thought I knew the story. (laughs) We're getting this all um, alive right now. What, what, what kind of support systems did you have? Or did you have mentors? I did. You know, Claudia was a great support for me. I had several other professors at the Claremont Colleges, like Sue Castaneda, Linda Perkins, who were very supportive. Uh, My grandmother Mm. was very supportive when I came home. And most of all, I had the community, uh, my my peers, my incarcerated and formerly incarcerated sisters and brothers. And as I started to connect more and more with them through the work of California Coalition for Women Prisoners, um, it just became real, you know, and I started to get involved in speaking and working on policy and different things. And it was education that allowed me to keep pivoting. The okay. more I learned, the more spaces opened up. Wow. And so it was just opportunity after opportunity, started traveling to conferences you know, got to meet Ruthie Gilmore and Bell Hooks and hang out Why with Bell Hooks? Davis and, you know, Gina Dent and Erica Miners. And, you know, now I'm in this space, Kimberly Crenshaw, 
-hmm. you know, I'm in this space oh. with all these, you know, amazing abolitionists, black feminists. Um, like this is what I want to do. Mm. You know, and the more I was in those spaces, the more I realized the impact of education and how transformative it really is, because a lot of my people don't see it that way. They see, oh, well, no one's going to hire me. Well, I'm, I'm not going to be this. But the more I push our students at Project Rebound to continue their education like I did, they the world continues to open up and open up and open up. Yeah. And so for your for your students and the students watching this and who will watch it, you know, your level of education can take you anywhere, you know, anywhere you want it to be. You can teach, you can write, but most importantly, you'll have a skill set that can help uplift communities. Yeah. You know, that's because once you change a person's mindset, you know, once you show them that you know, someone cares about them and that they're able to make a difference in the world and put them on the path to education because that's what happened to me. You know, the sky's the limit. I wouldn't be who I am today without the Claudia Rankins in my life. Wow. And likewise, you know, um, so much richness in what you just said there. And I think that C word is one I love, community. You have to, ha in a genuine community of of care um you know that is something that i learned from the activists in my community when i was growing up and trying to move forward with that now in my life and so speaking of now what you do professionally now you know you yourself are a phenomenal support system for others and i just have to run off this little list of things that you do to help support other people because i think it's so important for folks to see the synergy that you have created in your life through taking all of these sort of educational opportunities that you had those first of all like no one has that exact match that you have and so it makes you really unique so you help formerly incarcerated students feel like and know that they belong. You help people think through the effects of trauma. Um, you actively combat imposter syndrome and help share tips about that. Um, you conduct ally training. You're a Black feminist abolitionist, yes. And so what core skills do you have that enable you to do what you do? And why is your work so important to you? Um. Wow, that's a that's a great question. I I I think understanding that all of us have these these lives and 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 attachments to communities that intersect. And so just just understanding intersectionality and understanding um the black experience and the black struggle I think are ways that not only help me to see the world differently and see myself differently in the world, but but really allow me to um, want to bring other communities into this work. You know, Black people, we have always been about community. You know, we have always brought everyone into our houses, into our homes, into our barbecues. And so it's, it's, I think it's really my Black experience, my experience as a Black woman, understanding, you know, reading Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks, you know, and James Baldwin and, and all of these really rich narratives and stories about our culture that really helps me to want to give more of myself and experience, you know, and to challenge those around me to give more of the, their selves. You know, that's it. Uh, that's that's basically it. And and just to be a lifelong learner. Um, challenging others to give more of themselves. That is great, too, because it shows, again, how just the activist in you, it's 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 um it's an endemic part of who you are, you know, because some people will put on the activist hat. But when you really are willing to put yourself out there and not only challenge yourself, but challenge others. That's really how we can keep making change and change and change and change. That's what an abolitionist does. Yes. 
We dismantle things that are not good for our communities, that cause us harm. And we build the things that we want in our communities that help to make them healthy, whole, and sustainable. Mm, I appreciate that succinct breakdown of what you know an abolitionist does. Because I think people, whether it's that or also you mentioned a very important term, intersectionality. Sometimes that term can get misused. Um, I think we're getting a lot of education here today. <laughs> um, so the last question that I have for you before I turn it to the Q&A, because we do have a question in there from Erica Sausner. Um, you know, I have to ask you about the session title that you chose. <laughs> um, so because I couldn't help but think of the Miranda rights and you have the right to remain silent. And I don't know if you had a connection in mind there when you made uh, up the title for this session, but what does your silence will not protect you mean to you? Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for bringing in Miranda rights because we do have the right to remain silent, but do we? Mm. You know, when we do, re when we remain silent, people speak for us. Yeah. You know, only we should speak, we know our stories and we should tell our own stories. We should be the historians of our own stories. And so the title really came from Audre Lorde, mm -hmm. you know, and, and her work. Um, as it, it just really spoke to me, just like the personal is political. You know, your silence will not protect you. Silence can also be a very violent thing. Yes. You know, when you're in, in relationships and you don't speak to someone and, and they they need you to communicate. It can it can really hurt very deeply. Trauma, um, trauma. So I yeah, trauma again. You know, so we need to we need to tell our stories because if I had not told my story, if I had not been willing to tell my story over and over and over again, I wouldn't be here. You know, people would be telling the worst parts of my life rather than the best parts of mm -hmm. my life. And so a lot of our folks who have gone through the carceral system, they want to go underground. They want to hide in the shadows. And so this really is for them to challenge them to tell their stories, because if you don't tell it, it will be mistold. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to be the representatives of who we are, and we need to know that our silence will not protect us. And that reminds me of um, Othello and just speak of me as I am. Um, Ooh, I yeah. love it. And so, yes, yeah, so we have to, we have to be the historians. Um, one last thing I want to say, because you mentioned this, you know, hiding. When I chatted with you and we had our pre-chat, I loved where your office was. And I was just wondering, you know, in, in the library, I was just wondering if you could tell people before I turn it to Erica's question, what your office looks like, this glass space and why? Yeah, so the Center for Hope and Redemption is, it's a square, it's just a bunch of window panes in the, in the main campus library, right in the center. And is the visibility of who we are. It's about our students being seen, but also, you know, what it represents, visibility mm -hmm. of our experience, of our population. You know, we're not hiding. Yeah. You know, we're 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 not gonna do that. You know, that's that's the criminal legal system. Mm -hmm. That's that's who wants us to hide and run. We're not gonna hide and run. We've earned the right to be on that campus. And we want to be front and center. So not only do are we visible, but that we are be we are able to be seen because what we're able to do is remarkable. Yes, and people should know about it. Absolutely. Um, so on that note, because we've got about ten minutes left, and as I told you earlier, I was like, I knew I was like I could talk to you for days. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to, um, I'll say out loud, but I'll also put it in the chat for you, Romerilyn, um, the question, but I'll read it too, just so that it's in the recording. But so um, Erica says, you mentioned the value of grad law school stu or students telling your story, engaging different frameworks, et cetera, but given the power distance between them, their privilege being on the outside, did they ever get it wrong? How did you address that? What guidance would you offer folks who are in similar positions of privilege in advocacy contexts? 
Great question. And yes, people do get it wrong. When they get it wrong, you know, we don't have to teach people. We don't have to, but I think we can enlighten folks. Um, but it comes a point where sometimes they're just not your people. And I, I had to fire a grad student. Oh, wow. That that really didn't get me. Didn't get me. Didn't I didn't feel like he wanted to get me. And so I had to let the law professors know that I don't want this person to represent me. And so I think people need to have that right um, to move on and vice versa. And so my, I, I address it that way. And the guidance would be is just to recognize when you're in the wrong lane, mm. you know, you just need to recognize it and you need to pivot. And I think that's a skill that I've de developed over the years, uh, along with resiliency, but just to pivot. You know, you you can't force a square peg in a round hole. Mm -hmm. It's not going to fit no matter how you try. So you just need to keep going and find your community. Like you said, the C word is so important. Find your community, find your lane, find the things that you do well and connect with that. Yeah, no. And I guess. I'm also wondering too, another question that I'll ask as we wait and see if other folks, feel free to ask questions, folks, if you have them, but in the Q&A um, function of the app, but um, what is that experience like, you know, coming from 24 years old, um, being incarcerated to now being in this position where you are, you know, you are working with people like Kimberly Crenshaw and Claudia Rankin and just, you um, having access to so many things that probably at 24, you never thought, I, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't want to get your story wrong in your head. But um, did you think you would have access to these kinds of things? No. As there was a period of time, I never thought I'd be released from prison. Right. You know, and so, no, you know, but some, you know, there you you want to keep hope alive. So you're always hoping and praying that you'll get out. But that's why I thought ministry was going to be my place. I never thought that I would be working in a university system. I never thought I would have access to so many brilliant scholars in the world. Mm. You know, I didn't think I would be able to travel. I didn't think I would have, you know, a story that people would even be interested in. There's just so many things that I didn't think would be happening to me because I had been told by the criminal legal system, the prison system, correctional officers, et cetera, and so on, that this is all you're ever going to be. Mm. You know, when people leave, they come back. You're looking at recidivism rates at 67%, 62%, 57% all the time. You're seeing your friends leave the prison and come back over and over and over again. And so I never thought that I would have this life. I never thought I would be speaking to people like you at universities all over the world, but here I am. And that's, that's the transformative power of education. And that's, that's why I, I push this thing so hard because it opens up the world, you know, colleges and universities are many, many cities. They have everything, but what they, and what they have is a diverse population. Most of the time, people from all walks of life, you know, and when you start to make those different connections, when you, when I step outside of the black community into the lean, Latino community and into the API community and into the, the other spaces, I get to learn so much, not only about our differences, but our similarities. And that's really super important. And what you just said really resonates with what our speaker on Wednesday, Simon Wu, um, said just about, of course, um, community, but also using everything that you have access to, to create this life that you want to have and figuring out balance and making um calculations was the term that 
that Simon used. And I love that because I've mm -hmm. often thought about making calculations in my life or just having all these moves sort of work together. So I really appreciate that. We do have another question. Um, I will read it aloud, but I'll also put it in the chat for you, uh, Romerilyn. And I love this one too. Um, you mentioned communities of women while you were incarcerated. And I'm wondering in this, uh, if and how those communities of currently incarcerated folks are supported by your current work. Yeah, thank you for the questions. So a lot of my work with uh, the California Coalition for Women Prisons is we monitor women's prisons in the state of California. So we help to pass policies that impact um, California prisons. We work with other organizations on closed women prisons campaigns. We provide mutual aid to incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women. We support them through Project Rebound, through education, helping them get admitted and enrolled in our programs across the state. You know, when folks come home, we have parole. Um, we have uh, reentry support. We also have parole prep support. We have uh, writing warriors where folks write to incarcerated people, non, um, gender non-conforming and trans folks. We also include those folks in our work. Um, and we also have a visiting team where we help with different legal issues, et cetera, and so on. So there, there's a, a lot of what the work that I do that goes back into the prisons. But we also um, have a monthly meeting called Fire on the Outside where formerly incarcerated women gather once a month as a support group. And so there's just a number of ways um, that I connect uh, back to, to the folks that I've left behind. And, and some of those uh, entities that you just mentioned, are those, again, places that could potentially use folks who have the skill sets that we've been talking about today? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, our LA chapter of the California Coalition for Women Prisoners consist of mostly uh, academics from UCLA okay. that have to organize the work of um, the legal teams that are going in, the prison visiting, the writing warriors, um, all of our um, services that we provide for incarcerated women. We help to, um, we help folks with their commutation applications, their pardon applications, which, you know, it was, it was the folks at UCLA that helped me with my part in the application. Sarah Haley, Grace Hong, Kobe Lentz, you know, so it's all of that too. And so this is a way again to use all of all of the learning that you have in framing stories and storytelling to help people win their freedom, to help people get liberated. And that I, I think there's no better way to use our skill sets than to help people become free. For sure. And I love when I've been hearing you speak, you know, for the past hour, how you constantly invoke the names of people who helped you. I think that is so important because um, we don't get to where we are alone. Um, Never. And I guess I just have, we're all basically at time. I just want to ask you one last quick question because I know that people probably can benefit from this answer too. What advice do you have for people? Because, you know, whether it's grad school, job searching, whatever. People, we all face a lot of rejection in this world. Um, what advice do you have for people in terms of how to overcome those feelings that start to fester when you are dealing with so much rejection? It's their loss. You mm -hmm. know, you, you have to know that you're an incredible person and you may not be ready for a job that is on paper, you may not interview well, you know, people may reject you because it's just not your day, you know, but just consider it a learning opportunity and check the next door. When one door closes, another door is open. You know, we always say all of these things, but it's hard when your feelings are crushed. Yes. But you know, I've been rejected so many times. It don't even bother me anymore. <laughs> Likewise. You know, be, be, because I've been able to go on 
and do even bigger and better things that I never imagined, never imagined. So don't take it as a loss, mm -hmm. you know, take it that it's not for you yes. and go on to do something else because you just never know. Like I see all over Twitter and I love this little phrase, rejection is redirection. And look at how you're like, I love it. Redirected. Yes. It snaps to that. And so on that note, we're going to end there. Thank you so much for Marilyn for being with us and for sharing your wisdom and your story. Really appreciate it. Well, it's been, it's been a pleasure. And thank you so much for having me, David. And thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, coming to listen to my story. I appreciate you all. All right. Thank you so much, Romero. I'll be in touch. All right. Bye-bye. Be safe.